Welcome to Frank Fridays. I am the founder of Art Frankly, and I would like to introduce you to my co-host, Ellie Hayworth. Ellie is the founder of Hayworth Communications Consultancy. Hayworth is committed to promoting intrepid ideas in art and design. Ellie has grown her business to command a full scope of client services, including content strategy, speaking engagements, events, business strategy, content development, you name it, Ellie can help. <laughs> and today we have the pleasure of speaking with Michael Church, who is the director at Palmieri Fine Art, a full services private advisory firm, also known as PFA. There he interfaces directly with the firm's collectors, both large and established, or just starting their collecting handling all art-related needs beginning to end. Michael has a lot of wonderful insight to share. So Ellie, over to you. Amazing. Thank you, Carlina and Michael. It is truly a pleasure to chat with you today. So thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Long time listener, first time caller. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, so Michael, as Carlina mentioned, you are the director at PFA. Um, when we last spoke with you with Art Frankly for your Frank Talk in 2019, you were in that role. So I'm just curious to hear, you know, a lot has happened since 2019. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about, you know, the evolution and how your role has changed over the past few years. Well, we just make NFTs now constantly, <laughs> just kidding. Um, <laughs> um, I would say it's I wouldn't it's, put it right behind you guys, you know. Just pumping them out know. left and right. Just <laughs> you want this JPEG? It's a hundred thousand. Done. Um I love it. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I would say like in 2019, early 2019, I was really in I felt good about the role. I really knew what we were doing. Um, like I'm sure we'll speak about 2020 and other parts of this, you know. So I'll like leave that part out. I would say that like it's just we just continued. Uh, to expand the kinds of services we offer as advisors and not just like doing more things, but more creative things. Um, sure. We've had, we've been doing a lot of appraisals, um, especially last year, we had the privilege of doing a very significant um, donation to the um, uh, University of Georgia, a client donated amazing. 110 works, which was amazing. Yeah. And so we got to kind of help everything being to end, did a huge appraisal for it. So that was really rewarding. I mean, um, I would say like my role is the same, but like we've gotten, what I've like learned more and more from, I work with Gabrielle from Palmieri, also known as Gabby, is sort of like, not just like, how do we present information to our clients? How do like, you know, how do we, how do we make the data like a, a story? How do we like sure. give this information we're preventing? Like, what's the narrative? What's the argument we're, we're showing? And like, that's something I've like gotten kind of like gotten a lot of more under my belt of not just like, here are some comps. Well, why are we showing these comps? What do these mean for this particular work? What's make, what makes it special? You know, what like, what story are we trying to tell here? Like, where, why is this good value? So like, it's kind of just been more of, um, more of that. And, and like I said, just kind of like expanding the services that we're, we're doing in fun, exciting ways. I love that. Um, and Michael, just for context, um, it truly is just for curious minds. How large is the advisory firm? How many team members? Is it just you and, and Mrs. Palmieri? Or Ms. Um, Palmieri? It's kind of, we have a good team. We're, we're like, um, it's, it's, we have three full-time people and we have a wonderful collections manager who works for us part-time as well. Um, yeah. So I've been there since the beginning when Gabby formed it in 2017 and really yeah. kind of helped figure out how we were going to do things. And she brought all these amazing clients. And I came from a different advisory from nine years and kind of had mm -hmm. a lot of practices um, that that were like, to be honest with you, sort of like ingrained in me that she kind of had to like break out. You know, like yeah. I came from this space of, of like, we're in a box and we do these things, you know, like a client might have like a personal chef, they might have an attorney, they might have an interior designer and we're the advisors and we do this and that, you know? And I kind of had to like be retrained not retrain, but like understand, like we do all these other things. And so, <clears throat> yes, we're art advisors, but we're also, we are appraisers. We also sure. help place things at auction. We um, connect people directly to artists. Um, we do charity auctions. Like there's all kinds of things that aren't like necessarily every single advisor would list on their website. Absolutely. And that's kind of the fun part, honestly, is like when we have to do a proposal to a new client, it's like very hard because they have to go back and remember like all these different kinds of exciting things that we, we've yeah. been able to do as, as advisors. 
No, I love that. And I think, I mean, there is something exceptional about being so well-rounded and also just getting to wear a lot of hats. And I'm sure you have some very interesting, um, just very interesting anecdotes as well as just some like amazing um, fun facts and, and just best practices that you've taken away from it. And perhaps, Michael, to that effect, um, you know, last year was a bit of an unconventional year for everyone. And, you know, it's curious to just hear a little bit more, you know, what responsibilities shifted or what did you see really come to the fore when you were doing your, you know, kind of your client due diligence over the course of the past, you know, year to even, I would say, 16 months? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure I can't, like, speak to anything more than your other guests have spoken to about how different it is now, but I mean... In a lot of ways, not much changed. I mean, we still have clients sure. all over the, the world and the country that still are buying things from, you know, looking at things from all over and like things still have to get from point A to point B. So to use an example, like international shipping became quite difficult last year. <laughs> Maybe you know this, Absolutely. like, you know, there were lockdowns, there were, you know, you know like things couldn't, couriers couldn't be on flights anymore mm -hmm. because they couldn't physically be there, you know, like a lot of this changed, but, but on the other hand, like, what needed to get done didn't really change. Um, Understood. But I mean, like there were those like literal difficulties uh, that I'm sure it's not interesting to go into like the specifics, but like, how do you get something from Switzerland to Greenwich, Connecticut during the pandemic? You know, I, I mean, I would say like <laughs> my role- By the way, those are not everyday problems for, you know, well, most <laughs> of the world. So I do think it's kind of interesting to think through, you know, these were things that we really were confronted with. And I think I mean, one of the individuals we spoke with last week, there was a clay shortage. So it's, it oh, is, yeah. I think, kind of intriguing to see how the pandemic has manifested specifically in the art world. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like, I guess it's, it is interesting, like, like knowing like that there's a freighter between Barcelona and Miami, but only in April. So like, yeah. what does that mean in terms of getting a sculpture there, you know? Um, I think kind of to go back to your question, like obviously we're all working remotely now and I'm I'm a director, sure. we have a small team. Um, I kind of, I've found like a, a comfortable place of being kind of like the listener and the like interface. Like I have check-ins every day. Um, you know, obviously we had to switch all this like technology. We had to, you know, we have Zoom and all that, but it's kind of like, I think of everything in a non-linear way. So if we have a sure. project, it's like, okay, great. Um, this has to get done by the end of the day. Who's doing what? Okay, we can do like, you do this portion. You look up museums. You find art net comps. Like you write the essay. And, and kind of like piecing it all together. I, I have a real love-hate relationship with the uh, with we, where are we? You know, like, yeah. we'll look into this for you. We'll take care of this. You know, I, when I was earlier in my career, I just, I, it really bugged me because it was felt like, well, I'm I'm the one doing it. So like, why don't you just say, Michael will take care of that, but I understand sure. it a little better now. And it, it's definitely um, thanks to the environment that Gabby has created that like truly we're all responsible. Like we have yeah. we're, we're called team PFA is what we say. And so like, yeah, if I you don't, it. if you never give somebody the opportunity to do something that maybe is like outside their experience level or comfort level, even like they're never going to evolve or grow. You. Like, so mm -hmm. to give another example, so we've had a summer intern now uh, twice. I'm sure we'll have another one this summer, but this summer intern was very different. The internship was very different. Like Absolutely. we weren't together, you know, they were in another state. Um, and, and like, it's funny because things that I would think of like systems that, that, that she came up with that I wouldn't have thought of that were sort of just like solutions to what we had to do. Like we track yeah. auctions and you know, what yeah. you would do, you would go to the auction you'd have the catalog and you'd write it in, right? And so you could go back yeah. and you could see what they're, well, guess what? We can't do that. <laughs> there aren't even catalogs. <laughs> so she was like, yeah. well, why don't we do a spreadsheet? So that seems so obvious, but it wasn't at the time. Like that was just I a understand. problem we had to solve. And so now we do, they kept getting more and more advanced. And so now we can do like, you know, total low estimate, which things were withdrawn, like yeah. things with IB. And, 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 and now we have these like, essentially not to like plug a the bear facts, like essentially we do these like bear facts style, like things round like, ups. Rat, like in an hour, like it's kind of amazing. Yeah. And that was something that our intern who's lovely and very smart was just like, oh, well, this is how I'm going to solve this problem, you know? And because yeah. we weren't together, like she would be going to Absolutely. the auctions if she were here, but we can't do that. So I don't know. I, I love that those, those kinds of things have kind of happened naturally. And now they're part of our, our, Your our work club. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think I think that's really that's kind of incredible. I also love um, 
from, from what I'm hearing, just in terms of this kind of work environment that you guys have fostered, it's a very both top down and bottom up approach. So I love that the interns totally. are helping to propose different workflows, but you're also having someone who's exceptionally senior like Abby, who's imparting different best practices. So I don't know. Absolutely. I think that's a really great anecdote for the listeners on, you know, on this Frank Friday. Um, I'm curious personally, Michael, how have you, so I think you know, following auctions virtually and all of that seems to fall into this question, but you personally, how are you staying connected to the arts? Have you been kind of visiting some museums? How have you been engaging over the past few months? I, I was thinking about this and I mean, I haven't been to that many museums or shows, but I, I kind of want to like answer it in a different way, which is like, how am I staying sure. connected to the people themselves? I mean- absolutely. So like as an advisor and specifically doing collections management, which is sort of my background, we're relying on all these different vendors, right? Like installers, framers, et cetera, et cetera. And so none of that really changed, but now it's like everybody is so, it's so much more important, your relationship with all of these different colleagues Absolutely. more so than ever. So sure, I've taken clients around to galleries on a Friday and, and you know, and like curated a list, but it's so much more meaningful now in a way because everybody's so grateful to be doing this. Honestly, this job is a luxury. Like we work in yeah. kind of a luxury industry in a sense, like Absolutely. I, I get to see art every day, you know, that, you know, so that's, yes, we should be grateful, but it's just kind of funny. Like it took last year for people to really realize in, in some ways, like, oh, I, I have the privilege of being like shown these shows that I might be interested in. I can speak to it. And so even though those are more limited now, it seems like they're more powerful and and meaningful. I love that. So that's how yeah. I was thinking about this. It was like people that I haven't heard from in a long time and I can check in with about a, a utilitarian reason, like we need to ship this thing or something like that. I'm like, oh, how have you been? And like ha have these conversations that I wasn't having before, you know? Yeah. I also think, I mean, it's so interesting, you know, Carlina and I always have this conversation, but, you know, it's actually strengthened a lot of relationships that perhaps otherwise, you know, were either social in nature or they were, you know, I think with the art fair circuit, some of it was very um, circuitous in terms of like where we were geographically. And so I don't know, I think that's a very meaningful way to respond to that question. So I appreciate that. Uh, that was great. Um, one of the really fun things I, as I mentioned kind of before we started this interview, um, you know, I, I really enjoyed listening or reading rather your Frank talk. And I think Michael, you have like a really interesting trajectory to getting to art and you had, you know, spoken about having these aspirations to go into science and, and then science somehow segued into a love of film and then film segued into a BFA in photography. So I don't, maybe you can just tell us a little bit about yourself and, and your journey to art. Sure. I, um, I went to this, uh, I'll just uh, uh, mention my alma mater. I went to this boarding school, a free boarding school in North Carolina called the North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics. Okay. Just rolls off the tongue. It's just a beautiful name. <laughs> um, it's, it was the very first free boarding school, uh, magnet school in the country. So Interesting. It was, we lived together. It was an old hospital. It was amazing. So I thought I'd be like a computer engineer or something. I thought maybe, I don't know, some kind of scientist. Um, sure. But they, they have this thing, I think it's a French thing, but it's where two weeks per year, you do something completely different than whatever mm -hmm. your curriculum is. And so we started making these dumb movies, which are on YouTube somewhere, nobody looked them up, but- um, <laughs> Shameless plug. Started in that. <laughs> <laughs> um, we don't have the rights to the music, don't look them up. Um, anyway, anyway, that turned into maybe I wanna go to film school. I applied to all the film schools. I wanna do editing. The whole point of this journey is that I realized that like, A, I can't like draw or sculpt or sing by the way, but I can use tools. So like the, the camera is nothing but a tool. The, the interesting thing about a Absolutely. camera, I'm a very shy person, as you can tell, um, but a, a camera puts you, it's physically in between you and the viewer, right? Yeah. It, it, yeah. it provides like- It's like an conduit. intermediary. It's yeah. an intermediary, exactly. It's like, it's a way for you to have an interaction yet you're distant, right? Yeah. You can control what you're showing. So that's what really appealed to me about photography. I, I still take pictures to this day. I'm not really, an, I'm not, I wouldn't call myself an artist, but that was always sort of like, okay, well, there's a system that I can perfect and a tool I can use. Yeah. And so when I got to New York and I thought, oh, I'll work somewhere. I ended up working at um, Sotheby's, which I was so grateful for. And yeah. then that was just like throwing you in front of things left and right and learning things Absolutely. constantly. Yes, I think New you artists. mentioned that you were working in the cage, which I thought the was cage. really interesting. <laughs> yeah. So maybe you can unpack that a little bit for the listeners. 
my first job, it was at Sotheby's and it was really just like checking everything off and putting it into their database system. And then it would go through specialist departments and framing and all that, you know, it go from A to Z, right? That yeah. fascinated me because I was just like, I liked, I'm a problem solver. I like yeah. finding creative ways to solutions. And, and it was just interesting to me that like you could be in the back of the house. Again, I am a kind of a very shy person. I have a lot of confidence issues. Um, so being able to like help with everything that's happening and like, who's the best person that can do this? What's the best way to do this? And just like always striving for the best practice really interested me. So that's how I kind of got into collections management. And yeah. through that was interacting with clients all the time and just found that like, I, I just have this natural fit where I really care about the art. Yeah. Like it's kind of, it's kind of not, maybe not the best thing to say, but like, I sort of care about the art first and then the client second. <laughs> but then if you're a collector, they actually want to hear that, that you like really. Of course, I was going to say, I think we're all in it because, you know, it's a vocation as much as it is. I mean, this is a, it's a hustle of an industry to be in. And so I think you have to love the art or you lose the mm -hmm. reward. Yeah, agree, agree. Yeah, I love that. Um, I think, you know, this maybe is a great segue. You were talking a little bit about best practices and coming up with systems. You know, what is one thing that you do, and you did answer this question in your Frank talk, but I'm curious if it has evolved. Um, what is one thing you do in your professional life every day? Like, what is one best practice that you do every day? Um, I keep a bullet list. It's not a very exciting answer to that question. And I, it's, I get made fun of for my bullet list all the time. It's getting longer and longer. It's got color yeah. codes, it's got, you know, symbols and all this stuff. But I just, I think you need a system. Some people yeah. use a um, like um, calendar. What are those called? The, the books, you know, some people have notes that they take digitally, whatever it is, you need something because at the end of the day, I'm sorry, you're not gonna remember everything. And yeah. there's gonna be something that reminds you of something else. Like you have to keep track of what you're doing. So every single day I, I take this thing out, I reference it. I like, what are the things that need to happen today? Or what are the things that'd be great for me to follow up on? Or what are the sure. things that are from like a week ago? You know, people have different ways of doing the same thing that I'm talking about. That's mine. It's like, okay, what have I missed? What, what do I need to like follow up on? Who needs to be told about something? Could I remind Gabby about this? But, you know, could I, so on and so forth. Absolutely. No, I, I mean, I have kind of a similar, a similar system and I certainly, I still write all of my to-do lists and it's a daily practice and there are pages and pages of almost reiterated oh. versions of that to-do list with, you know, five things crossed off every day and then five new things that replace those. So I think, you know, Michael, you're in good company on that one. <laughs> of course, it's fun to go back because like I, I keep all of them, obviously they're treasured yeah. memories. So you can like go back and treasured memories. Yeah, I have my notebooks as well. It is fun to see how you evolve over the course of your career and certainly, you know, working under the tutelage of different individuals. Um, maybe as we just start to kind of wrap up the interview, you know, one of the questions that I wanted to pose was, what is one thing that you really feel you've learned through PFA or under Gabby's tutelage that is um, really meaningful for you, either in your collection management work or just about appreciating art at large? What is, you know, kind of one takeaway from your, from your work with PFA? I think, I think to, I could talk about it in many different ways, but the phrase we use is friends and family, your friends yeah. and family of PFA, that's what we say. And it's about, it's, it's about like a, not, like I said before, not having a box that every, like our services are this and our compensation is this. Like that's what's, that's a real specific way of answering this question. Like to have many different forms sure. of relationships with people, of many different mm -hmm. forms of compensation. That's something I've learned, but it, it goes further when it's, it's like, um, A, having fun, honestly, like we have a lot of fun and yeah. a, a, ch a challenge for me has always been I, I'm, I'm too nice in a lot of ways and I kind of like let things go and I sort of like don't want to push on things so I really learned from her like you need to recognize that you're really good at your job and that people like you and you can speak yeah eloquently and you know so that's a confidence thing but also that I want to work with people that are pleasant and fun Absolutely. and when they answer the phone they're like oh my gosh so I'm, I saw your name on the phone and I'm, I'm so excited to talk to you you know like it's not hard to be a 
a nice person and to be I'm sure we all have our days, especially now, like, yeah, where there's like low-lying depression and every once in a while. Of course, of course. But if but if there's certain people like a like, you know, like like a framer, let's say, that like you there's like a million framers in New York City, but like if there's sure. a couple that just are really nice a joy to, to work, work with, with yeah. a joy, like you know what? That that's the dream is to just have like a, a circle of joy to work with people and okay. clients and colleagues that's the friends and family so that like if something is a deal we could do and you make maybe slightly less than you would have made if you like did it in a harder way but it's somebody that you want to keep working with or help out that's that's what we always do and that's something I've learned from her is, is like I said like not having like such a strict thought of like what we do and how we can do it and also just being creative like yeah. there's this there's this feeling I think sometimes we have especially as like doers of like well it's got to get done it has to get done and you know there's a deadline and like knowing that and yeah. then not giving yourself the option to do it in a creative spontaneous kind of different yeah. way and it, you just kind of what I've learned is just kind of like accept that like it will get done it's going to be good sure it might sure. be a little crazy at the end but if we never <laughs> did the crazy the 11th part, hour yeah, but like, otherwise, it's not going to be spectacular. Like, I'd rather be delightful and interesting and spectacular than just like yet another project. Is out By the door. way, show me an ambitious art project that didn't come together at the 11th hour. And I, I just, to me, I feel like everything, there is kind of beauty in that, like, you know, that kind of uh, the witching hour, if you will, where everything comes together and then the lights go on and the people show up. And it's so I, I completely appreciate that as well, Michael. Um, I think just to round out today, we love to talk, um, you know, our last question is always, what is one positive takeaway over the course of the last year, which was certainly very challenging, but it could be personal, it could be professional, but what is one thing you hope people walk away from last year with? I sort of, uh, sort of already touched on this, but I think it's just being grateful for what we get to do and yeah. be, like being able to help a collector build their collection, see art, understand it, understand the value, you know, you know discover things. Yeah. I think that's something that I will always re remember 2024 is that despite everything, people can still be wowed by art and can still mm -hmm. just be really, I keep saying grateful, but that's really the word. When you get, when you open up painting straight from an artist studio in somebody's home and it's like the first major painting they've ever bought and you've kind of like guided them but it's theirs and they're just like oh, I didn't see that in the JPEG oh my god you know and you're like there with yeah. them I had a lot of those moments last year and I I will never forget I mean, you know that's one positive thing that I can say I love it. I, yeah, I think that is, it is a wonderful note to conclude on. And it's definitely something that we should all strive to have that level of gratitude because I think we are doing what we love. And so we should, we should Agreed. remember to, to enjoy the details. Agreed. It's great. Well, Michael, this has been a true pleasure. I have very much enjoyed speaking with you and, you know, just thanks again for taking the time to speak today for our Frank Friday. Oh my gosh. Thanks for having me. It's amazing. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. <laughs>